Yeah, Cole, you were not able to access the um, reading. Mm -hmm. I just received an email requesting permission. Sorry. Oh yeah, I wasn't. Okay, let me check. Just make sure that the permissions have been granted. Thank you. 
Good morning. So good afternoon, actually. Um, uh, thank you for joining us today. I had a strange thing this morning. I was I woke up and I checked I do pages of El Pais to see when I can get my my vaccine. I've been crawling along a glacial pace, um, and so I was I was wondering like, is there any updates or any news? Anyway, so I was looking at the page of El Pais, and then this article caught my eye about some new um, Spanish poetry anthology, which was in, which was like which was engaging like different kinds of poets. So for whatever reason, I clicked on it, and I and it said that there someone had had dared that was the word they used to introduce a poet named by the word Rosalia. Uh, so I'm like, who's that? And they're compared to Lorca. So I'm like, who is this, this Spanish person of letters? So I went to uh, I went to to Google and I typed in her name. <laughs> <laughs> So a bunch of videos came up. So I clicked on the first one, 100 million views. Uh, it's very strange. I don't know. It was like people dressed as gypsies or something. I, I understood absolutely nothing of what she was saying or singing, what was going on. So then I had to watch it again, this time with lyrics. <laughs> it was called apparently Malamente. Um, so I'm sitting there like in my, I've just woken up. Like I'm still in bed looking at my phone, like this sort of, squat short balding canadian guy in his 50s watching rosalie on my phone and i'm thinking what the fuck am i doing right i'm teaching russo today this is not dignified so <laughs> that's how my day started so i'm hoping that we can uh, raise our game a little bit here from where it started uh in the in the morning i called my wife i said have you heard of this person she said you know who this person is i said i have no idea who this person is anyway um, so today we're going to look at the discourse on inequality, which is one of these, um, which is a text that we've been able to introduce into our class as a result of the curricular expansion made possible by uh, moving some of our content into the offline format. So this has opened up some space for us and we're taking advantage of that space actually for the next couple of sessions because uh, we're going to cover today the discourse on inequality. And then we're going to turn our attention to Wollstonecraft, which is perhaps the text I'm most happy to find space for in my curriculum. Uh, and then de Tocqueville's uh, famous Democracy in America, which I think deserves, uh, deserves our time as well. So we have this moment now where we're going to move to a more lecture-driven phase of the class. Uh, and that's coming up then over the next couple of weeks. We have a double session. I'm not yet sure exactly what we'll do in that double session, but I will either devote the entire session either to Wollstonecraft or to Tocqueville. Both of them can make good claims on several hours of our time. So I'll, I'll make that sort of executive decision as it, as it were. Um, I very quickly remind you, I know that many of you got your hops in essays yesterday. I haven't looked to see exactly how many essays I have to grade. Um, I'm a bit scared. But uh, I also remind you then that next week you have Locke and thereafter you have Rousseau. So the interesting thing is the material we're gonna cover today uh, if you want to turn it into essay form, will not be relevant for several weeks. So what I'm going to do is I will record and then post the lecture today, uh, so you'll have it available to you offline. You want to go back and revisit it. And to that end, you will therefore not need your computers nor any digital device distractions. All you need are your ears, your mind, a happy and healthy attitude uh, towards uh, Rousseau's ideas. So let's let's put ourselves into a digital free environment. Um, and if you want to go back and sort of take notes on the text, you can do that afterwards. I will also note that because of this, in the event I do not get through to the end of the material today, this morning with you, that's no problem. I'll just pick it up where I left off this afternoon. Those guys will be a bit confused. Uh, and then I'll post the whole thing as a kind of a single, single walker. Okay, computers down, please, ladies. Computers, computers, off, 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 off. Off, down, there we go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, people at home, you can keep your computer open for the moment. Who am I looking at on the screen here? Jude. Yeah, can you, I mean, as pleasant as Jude is to look at, uh, could you go to the, to the gallery view? Yes, I see you too, Jude. Um, and there you go, and hit gallery. Click. Gallery. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Okay, nice to see you. Now, I want to say, if you have aspirations to be an energetic and iconoclastic thinker, then uh, Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality is a book that should resonate with you. You may not agree with it, but this is the kind of text uh, that people who have a kind of naturally iconoclastic streak inside of them, who look at the world and think, I think we can do better. 
then Caruso speaks to that sort of um, that sort of mindset, not just in a structural way, but also in terms of the rhetoric that he deploys. We have had, admittedly, a couple of fairly dry, one might even call them procedural texts uh, in the last couple of classes. Hobbes with his step-by-step, -step, as much as I admire the language of Hobbes, nonetheless, it's sort of a very kind of step-by-step uh, um, -step walkthrough of what it means to enter into modern, uh, into a sort of modern vision of sovereignty. And similarly, Locke, it's again, a very kind of a procedural text, a sort of almost, we might say, a how-to in terms of constructing a sovereign idea. But with Rousseau, we have what is basically polemics, one might even call it a kind of journalism, uh, that is as much about the brashness of its tone than it is about the content. In fact, the two of them are really inseparable. What it is not is a procedural walkthrough of what sovereignty means in a, in a modern concept or making sort of laying out in the way that we saw in Locke and Hobbes, kind of very carefully uh, sequenced uh, set of ideas that then make the social contract inevitable, et cetera. Instead, we have a kind of uh, argumentative engagement with what we might call the conceit of modernity as modernity in the 18th century was understood in the context of the Enlightenment. And recall that in the 18th century, in the Enlightenment, we mentioned it last time, this notion of a discovery of reason that we as human beings had for too long uh, been under the sway of superstition and theology. And now for the first time, we were able to think through the issues surrounding us by using our human, our human reason. And so in the context of the Enlightenment, that idea of man or woman linked to their newfound capacity to reason and to reason publicly, to engage in the public use of reason, uh, meant that we were now no longer uh, benighted. We were no longer ignorant. Instead, we had the possibility for entering into a world of new knowledge. You may know the famous quote from Alexander Pope on Newton, uh, nature and nature's laws lay hidden deepest night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. That sort of an idea that we were moving out of the darkness into the dawn. And Rousseau comes along and essentially says, this reading that you have of man now moving forward, sort of fulfilling his destiny as is laid out by the mandate of his reason, this is wrong. That instead, Rousseau comes, with us, uh, comes to us with a very uh, contrarian uh, point of view. Now, in the lecture that I recorded, pre-recorded last year for Rousseau's social contract, I discussed in the first of those lectures both Rousseau's life, his career, his importance, context in which he's writing, uh, as well as covering a little bit of the first and the second discourse. Uh, so I'm not going to bother repeating that. I'm going to give you another uh, run through of Rousseau's biography. I'm going to jump right into the text. But I will mention that the second discourse is before the social contract and is perhaps the founding. Well, he wrote these two essays when he was in his sort of late 30s, early 40s. Um, the first was trying to show that the arts and sciences have not helped humankind. And then the second, this, uh, this essay is sort of more significant essay in many ways, in terms of its content, this discourse on inequality, this discussion about where inequality comes from and what it has, uh, what it has produced. And these two then pre-configure what Rousseau is then doing in the social contract. We might think of it as a kind of a twofold process. The first is to lay out the problems that we have uh, in our society as it was then. And then the social contract works out a kind of political, a political remedy. So in looking at this, the discourse on the origins of inequality, what we're really doing is we're thinking through the problem then that Rousseau tries to address in the social contract. And as such, we should think of those two texts together. They're sort of very, they're very closely, uh, they're very closely linked uh, together. So very quickly, he wrote this, uh, this little pamphlet that you can see here, I brought my book and I, I, I wrote the date when I bought this book, 1990. That's how old I am. Um, so I bought this in 1990. Here it is. I'm still reading it. Um, that's kind of nice, right? 30, 31 years later. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, made me feel a little old. Like, Shit, 1990, man. So anyway, so yes, 12 years before you were born, um, I bought this book. And he wrote this, the Discourse on Inequality, in response to an, a, a contest. It was kind of a, a thing that was done back in the day, a very Enlightenment kind of idea. Uh, you, would, you would hold an essay writing contest. It was, again, this, exact, this idea of a public use of reason. So in this case, I think it was the Mercure de France, which was a, a journal at the time, had this essay contest, which is, you know, send in your submission, send in an essay on the topic of, are the origins of inequality natural? 
the essay, essay topic. Um, and then the idea is they would publish the winner, it would provoke a debate, and people would go around and say, oh, did you read such and such an essay? It was that, that kind of an idea, a way to foster a public debate. And Russo, who had entered a similar contest in his, with his first essay, the one on the uh, arts and sciences, had won the prize for that particular essay contest. So perhaps in the sense that he was on a roll, he decided to write uh, for this one as well, which he did not win, I should go. In any event, this is when he, um, this is when he wrote this text. Uh, and it's very short because it's, you know, for this prize, it's not a very long thing. In my edition, it runs from barely 100 pages long, relatively small pages, and many of that are the notes that Rousseau included at the end. So it's a very short text. It's very quick and easy to read. Although I have to say, I read it several times, and each time I reread it, uh, I always enjoy it more for the language, at least, right? I love the language that Rousseau deploys. And if you read it slowly, some of the phrases will jump out at you. As I mentioned before, si vous êtes français, vous devez le dire en français, because his French is remarkable. Actually. It's a very, uh, very stylish text in, in its original language. Anyway, I will not be reading it in French, I'll be reading it today in English, be grateful. Um, so the text itself is in four parts, right? There are, formally the essay is in two, in, in has part one and part two, but there's actually four components to the, to the discourse. There is a dedication. So Rousseau dedicated this to the citizens of Geneva because Rousseau was not French, as you probably know, he was Swiss, he was born in Geneva. Um, and he lived, although he lived a lot of his life in Paris, he ended up back in Switzerland eventually. So he dedicates it in the, the first section consists of the, the dedication to the citizens of Geneva. This is followed then by a very short preface. And then we have parts one and parts two. And each of those sections is doing different intellectual work for Rousseau inside of this, uh, inside of this text. In the dedication to Geneva, Rousseau lays out his vision for an ideal republic, a kind of platonic exercise, really, a sort of Rousseauian Calipolis uh, that, he, that, he set, uh, that he sets out in the, um, in the preface. In the introduction, he lays claims or he, sta he, states, uh, he states the problem of the essay in terms of, of knowledge, is what he calls knowledge. He starts the essay by referencing an, an ancient Greek inscription, which is simply, know thyself. And keep that in your head for those of you who plan to come back and join us in our discussion of Nietzsche, because Nietzsche does something of the same thing when he starts his famous work on the genealogy of morals. He starts with this knowledge of, of or this question, sorry, of knowledge. How do, how do we know what we know? So the first gesture then is this notion of the ideal republic. The second uh, part in the preface is the question of knowledge. In part one, he then expands on the thought experiment uh, that we've already seen in this class in the last couple of sessions, this notion of man in a state of nature. So part one considers the, the idea of man in a state of nature. And then in part two, he turns his attention to civil society. So in some ways, it, it follows a kind of classical structure in terms of political theory. All the constituent elements are there. If you put that up and structure it against, for example, a layout of Hobbes, it would look very similar in some, in some regards, even though the text itself is very different. I will also note that he wrote this in a very, um, in, a, in a sort of clearly informed way with respect to the people that we have already read. There is a lot of Hobbes in this text. There's a lot of um, Locke in this text. There's a lot of Plato and Aristotle in this text, as well as other famous sort of jurists and thinkers of the 18th, uh, 17th and 18th century, particularly Grotius, who was influential in terms of formulating ideas about what we call natural law, and Pufendorf, the, uh, the German jurist who had also uh, turned his, uh, his question to the sort of legal uh, ideas of the state and contract and so on. So in other words, it's reacting to a body of acquired political thinking prior to Rousseau's actually picking up his pen. So what we want to do is I'm going to go, I want to go through each of these parts individually and pull out from them what we, what we see Rousseau, uh, what we see Rousseau doing. So we'll just go through an order in the, uh, in the text. So I want to turn, I want to start with the dedication, which, as I said, is to the citizens of, uh, of Geneva. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, you want to use your computer for taking notes? Go ahead. Well, to be fair, if you'd like to follow on your computers along with the text, if you have it in front of you, since I have now made it available, feel free. Otherwise, I would just recommend sitting back and listening. Um, so he, he dedicates it to the Republic of Geneva, whom he addresses as most honorable, magnificent, and sovereign lords. 
Uh, and there it follows this extremely obsequious, or what would seem like a very obsequious uh, discussion in which Rousseau says, if I could have chosen where to be born, I could think of no better place to have been born than in the city of Geneva, for it is such an ideal, it is such an ideal city, right? This is what he says. If I had chose, if I had to choose the place of my birth, right, Geneva would be the place that, that I would choose. Right? Question? What is obsequious? Obsequious. Thank you for asking. Uh, it's not from the French obsec, as you may think, although they are connected. Obsequious means uh, flattering or trying to gain favor through 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 exaggerated flattery. Um, so he goes through this lengthy description in the dedication. How wonderful so that, that, that he would wish to be born in this city and that city, or in a city that was like this and like this and like this. And how, isn't it wonderful that the city of Geneva is 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 just such a city? Um, but of course, it wasn't just such a city. It was a terrible place to be born in many respects. It was uh, under the thumb of Calvinism, one of the uh, most puritanical forms of the of the Reformed Church, and so on. It was hardly a free city. It was not a place where people were particularly had freedom of belief and freedom of uh, a lot of sort of civic liberties. So it's a very ironic text, essentially, right? He's, he's as it were playing a sort of sarcastic little game uh, from the very beginning of the text. At the same time, he then is able to use this by way of laying out what constitutes this notion of an ideal sovereignty, right? What does it mean to be inside of an ideal, an ideal civil society? He gives us a number, and you can see that it goes through them in, in order. I counted 10, um, a community proportioned in its extents to the limits of the human faculties, uh, a place where the interests of the sovereign um, are not separate, separated from that of the subject, a place where one can have the freedom to live and die free, uh, a place where no person should say that he was above the law, a place that has some antiquity, not some recently created institute or political system, but some, but a, a political society that has a certain amount of, um, of tradition guided and so on. And he lays all this out, I think, as part of um, a kind of a tease, because by the time we get to the end of the text, in fact, he's engaged in this exercise in deconstruction of civil society. So the fact that he starts his text with a kind of idea of what does ideal civil society actually look like creates a kind of ring, as it were, to the text. It starts out with this, this is the perfect, perfect republic. Then we go through this entire exercise in which civil society, the value of civil society kind of collapses before eyes. So when you get to the end of it, you go back to the dedication and say, right, here's, the society, here's what we live in. This is the place that we should be living in. And that creates a space. And it's that space into which the social contract then is, is fitted, right? The, the social contract then serves almost as a blueprint to get us from the world as it is to the world as he lays it out in the, um, in, in the dedication. I want to draw attention to a couple of things that he notes in the dedication that I think are interesting. He says um, towards the beginning, I should have been desirous to, this terrible translation, I, I would like to live and die free. That is so far subject to the laws that neither I nor any of anybody else should have it in our power to cast off their honorable yoke, that agreeable and salutary yoke to which the haughtiest necks bend with the greater docility as they are formed to bear no other. Now, this may raise the question, what is a yoke? It's the thing of the egg, right? No. A <laughs> <I'm> yoke. <laughs> <laughs> um, yoke, yes, I mean, welcome to the English language, right? <laughs> Why should these be pronounced the same? Anyway, so it's not yoke as in of an egg. A yoke is, if you think of it like an ox that's pulling a cart that has the uh, contraption around its neck to which you fasten the ropes, that's the yoke, that it keeps it harnessed to something. So a yoke is something that fastens you or we might say chains you to something else, right? Holds you, holds you down. And we've seen that notion. Does anybody know the famous first phrase of um, the social contract? One of the most famous phrases ever written, anyone know? Every man is born free and everywhere he is in chains, right? That's the very famous phrase of the, the first line of the social contract. And this notion of chain or of being chained, we've already seen it. Who used the metaphor of a chain? to talk about the law. Marx? No, we haven't seen Marx yet. Sorry. 
Yeah. Hobbes, what did Hobbes say? Do you remember? And when he spoke about freedom, I think he said that uh, the law can, like that the freedoms not that it can put the human in chains. That's right, but do you remember where the chains went from? I just remember that the, that the person is still free unless he's put in chains in his body. Well, we, we move into civil society, right? We subject ourselves to civil law. And now, as you've discovered by writing your essays, we subject ourselves to civil law because civil law is a, is a subset of natural law, right? It's an extension of natural law that we would then recognize the need to obey civil law. The author, the author of civil law, as we just, uh, some of you found in your essays on it's the question of authority, the ability to be an author. Uh, the author of civil law then is the sovereign, the sovereign of the state, since that sovereignty represents all of us. We are all the authors of our laws, right? Of these laws that control us. Uh, and you may remember the phrase he says is, from the lips of the sovereign to the ears of the subject, right? From his, from his mouth to our ears. This is the chain that extends. So that notion of a chain or a yoke, something that's controlling us or holding us down, as a metaphor for law, has already been introduced to us by Hobbes. So when he says that I would like to live and die free, which means I'm not actually free, but I'm subject to the laws that either not that neither I nor anybody else would like to throw off, right? nor anybody else should have it in our power to cast off their honorable yoke, an agreeable and salutary yoke. So you want to live in an environment where the laws that govern your behavior do not feel that, that they are burdensome, right? That you're the, the sense of freedom that you have is at the same time compatible, compatible with the laws that nonetheless impose restrictions or limits on your, uh, on your behavior. Um, he says also this notion of, I should, I should not have chosen to live in a republic of recent institution, so not some recently created uh, created state. Well, that's a bit rich for Rousseau since he helped to write several uh, constitutions for newly created states, including Poland and Corsica. But anyway, he says, a people once accustomed to masters are not able to live without them. If they attempt at any time to shake off their yoke, meaning the laws that control them, they lose still more freedom for by mistaking licentiousness for liberty to which it is diametrically opposed they generally become greater slaves to some imposter who loads them with fresh chains. So we see this comparison between what has been translated as license or licentiousness and liberty, or a distinction then between the notion of liberty and license. License to do what one please, liberty is to do what one ought, right? That's that distinction. Who made that distinction for us, remember? Who said liberty, do as you should, license, do as you wish. Who suggested that there was that? A, who said actually a state of liberty is not a state of license? Anyone remember? Anyone online? No. What's so? Locke, exactly. Locke starts out his famous description of the state of nature. Yet a state of nature be the, the, yet the man be in a state of nature have liberty. Yet it is not a state of license, right? And so here we see Rousseau sort of saying the same thing. People who have been controlled or dominated, once they lose that domination, they don't return to liberty. They go into licentiousness because we've lost that idea of liberty. So therefore, he says, we want to be in a state that's looked like this for some time. And the interesting idea that I think we might see here is he says at the end of that paragraph, when he said, I choose not to live in a republic of recent institution, um, he says, debased by slavery and the ignominious tasks imposed upon them, speaking of the Romans when they, when the sort of the myth of the Romans Empire Republic was that it threw off the, the kings that were the kings of Rome and established a republic. And he said, the Ro er, these early Romans debased by slavery and the ignominious tasks imposed on them, they were at first no better than a stupid mob, which it was requisite to manage and govern with the greatest wisdom. So that being accustomed by degrees to breathe the salutary air of liberty, their minds, which had been exhausted or rather brutalized under the burden of slavery, might gradually acquire that severity of manners and spirit of fortitude, which rendered them at length the most respectable nation upon earth. To become a free people is not something that happens immediately. It's not like we have this internal liberty that we can simply activate and thereby recreate ourselves inside of a free society if we have the opportunity to do so. Instead, to live as free subjects requires effort and time. It is a gradual process in which the liberty of the subject in a civil society is then being shaped by the institutions around it. And once we have that liberty, as he points out again in the dedication, 
It's hard work to preserve it. This is what we, in fact, should be doing. This is our duty as citizens, is to preserve the liberty for those who, uh, for those who follow. Um, and so this notion then of, we go through a bunch of others, as I say, the legislative should be invested in the citizens, um, it should not engage in dangerous innovations, uh, we should elect respectable tribunals, elect annually some of our fellow citizens uh, to administer justice and to govern. And finally, I like number 10, Those are, there's nine of them, and then the 10th thing that he wishes for is that it should have, it be in a nice spot, be, be pleasant to live, be warm, a temperate climate, fertile soil, and charming views. So you know, there's so he's not he's not uh, um, he's not impervious to the importance of, of a good physical of a good physical location. But the point then is, at the beginning of this text, we have this notion of sort of the mo this model of an ideal republic, in which a couple of things are pointed out to us that that in a civil society that we are inevitably going to be chained. We're inevitably going to be subject to this kind of yoke, as he calls it, the yoke of the of the law. That's just a feature of living in civil society. Liberty then, insofar as it can be expressed in the context of a political arrangement, must then always be a, li a liberty that is uh, constrained by a sense of um, a, a, a coercive power around us, right? There's no such thing as absolute freedom then, once we move into a civil society. And you'll see when you turn your attention to the social contract, that that's essentially what the starting point of the social contract is as well. When he says that man is born free and everywhere he is in chains, the purpose of the social contract is not, as you might think, to teach us how we can be free of those chains. Instead, it is to teach us how best to live in that enchained condition, that we are condemned by, being, by virtue of being inside of a civil society to live with these figurative chains. And so Rousseau wants to tell us what's the best way so that we don't notice them, so that we don't feel them. Uh, in particularly as being particularly uh, burdensome. And so that's sort of picked up in, the, in, this, in this dedication uh, to the city of Geneva. Now to reiterate, the city of Geneva is none of the things that Rousseau uh, claims for it. Maybe it has nice climate and uh, pleasant views, but for all the rest of it, this is not what the city of Geneva looked like uh, in the 18th century. So it is an exercise of what we might call sarcasm. Um, in laying out this, in laying out this idea, but by the time we get to the end of the text, I think the dedication then makes more sense when we see what Rousseau's uh, trying to achieve. Having moved through the dedication, Rousseau then starts the actual, the actual discourse, uh, the actual essay, which consists of a preface, and then parts, uh, parts one and part two. So to remind you, the preface lays out this question of knowledge, to which we'll turn in just a moment. Part one, Rousseau picks up on this metaphor, this, this thought experiment of man in a state of nature, although we'll see for Rousseau, it's not actually a, a metaphor uh, or a thought experiment. Um, and then finally, this question of civil society. So the question is, well, why, what do, why do we want to start, before we jump into the state of nature, where should we start? And this, uh, for Rousseau, is we need to start with an understanding, where this basic question is, how well do we understand ourselves, right? That's the kind of question that he, uh, that he has, this idea of he writes, the most useful and least perfected of all human studies is, in my opinion, that of man. Again, to quote Pope, presume the heavens not to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. So this notion that we are, as people who are uh, acquiring knowledge, that yet we have a very imperfect knowledge of ourselves. And that's, the, that's the, exactly the idea that Nietzsche will pick up on at the beginning of the genealogy of morals. Nietzsche calls us he calls Kenner knowers, and yet we have this great lacuna in our knowledge. We do not know ourselves. How good can our knowledge be if we cannot know ourselves? This is that Nietzschean uh, mandate that we find at the beginning of the genealogy pre-configured here in Rousseau. I dare say he says that the inscription on the Temple of Delphi did alone contain a more important and difficult precept than all the huge volume of the moralists. And the, pre the inscription on the Temple of Delphi was simply, know thyself. So this is the most important, the most important task, and as he says, um, the least perfected of all human society. And the reason Rousseau argues is that we have this very imperfect knowledge of who we are, is that we have been changed over time to make us less and less recognizable in terms of our what we might call our true selves. He gives the uh, analogy or example of a statue of Glaucon. You could choose really 
any statue that has been left out to uh, suffer the elements, bad weather, wind, and so on. What happens to a statue over time? It loses its luster, it loses its form, it loses its, uh, gradually it loses its, the clarity of its shape, and so on. It becomes weather beaten and the like. He says, the human soul, like the statue of Glaucus, did I say Glaucon or Glaucus? Glaucus. Uh, which time the sea and storms has so much disfigured that it resembles more wild beast than God. The human, the human soul is like that statue. That's what's happened to us by human soul, you might say, who we truly are as individuals. What, has, what is the equivalent then? What is, this, what is the force of disfiguration, disfigurement, that's taking place on the human soul, on, on human beings, much like weather and wind and rain disfigure a statue? It is society, altered in society, he says. The human soul altered in society by the perpetual succession of a thousand causes, by the acquisition of numberless discoveries and errors, by the changes that have happened in the constitution of the body, by the perpetual jarring of the passions. This has in a manner so changed in appearance, the human soul, so as to be scarcely, rec uh, scarcely distinguishable or scarcely recognizable. So in other words, the process, as it were, of living the lives that human beings have led in history has then, as it were, alienated ourselves or alienated the knowledge that we have of ourselves from who we actually are, which is this basic question. Who are we really, right? That's the sort of the basic idea. Now, I've, used, I've said that exact statement already in this class. Who are we really? Go back to Thomas Hobbes and the project that he lays out for us in the first part of book one in the Leviathan, which is entitled Of Man. That's the name of that uh, of that section of man. And you may recall that Hobbes in that text starts, we did, I didn't ask you to read the first seven chapters or so, but this question about how we get ideas and so on. <clears throat> but a lot of what Hobbes is doing in that text is deconstructing elements in our society that give us an impression of who we are. Some are dukes and kings, uh, some are peasants and, and, uh, and workers and laborers, artisans, etc. that we have different modes of belief and all this kind of stuff. And for Hobbes, all of that, what he calls convention, what I call convention, has gotten in the way of knowing who we truly are, right? So then for Hobbes, we see him start his political inquiry with this grand gesture, how do we, who are we? And the first thing we have to do is, dis is distinguish from who we are not. Take away all the things that society has created for us that we think we are, get rid of that, and then let's go back to first principles. What was the first principle? Once Hobbes has finished, with this, with this effort of deconstructing social convention, false ideas of power and difference and inequality and so on, the first principle then is let's put man into a state of nature, right? That chapter on man and state of nature proceeds from this exercise in, as it were, stripping away all the things that obscure our image of who people really are. Rousseau's doing exactly the same thing. This is essentially the same idea, right? That society, living in society, obscures our view from our true selves, from our true nature. And so we have to recognize that when we want to peer into, as it were, the human, the essence of what is our humanity, we have to then, as he says, uh, we have to recognize that that humanity, as we perceive it, has been altered irrevocably by society. Society has changed us so much that if we want to ask who we truly are, and I look at you now, all I'm seeing is some disfigured product that society has, has created. So that means we have to do what? We have to then imagine what did it look like before we were in or before we were affected by society, right? Like a statue being placed up before the rains and the wind uh, have, somehow, uh, have somehow altered it. He says shortly thereafter, every advance made by the human species only serves to remove ourselves, remove the species still further from our primitive condition. The more we accumulate new knowledge, the more we deprive ourselves of the means of acquiring the most important knowledge of all. And it is in a manner by the mere dint of studying man that we have lost the power of knowing him. It's a curious kind of dialectic that the act of acquiring knowledge uh, as people makes people themselves less knowable to people. Something like that, right? If you work through the logic of what I just said, that might work. Because people study things. Yeah, I think I'm not going to try to repeat that. But it was something like that. Um, 
Is that clear? So the notion is that as we, as we acquire more ideas, we become more sophisticated in our understanding. And yet what means is that who we truly are disappears or becomes harder and harder actually to perceive in reality. This picks up what he wrote in the first discourse on the arts and the sciences, how the arts and the sciences um, allowed man to progress. And Rousseau in that discourse rejects the telos that arts and sciences are about man getting better, man progressing. Instead, as he argues in that discourse, all that's happened is arts and sciences are the manifestation of the alienation of people from themselves. And so here he is picking up on this, on this, basic, on this basic idea. So this creates a problem of, we might call it a, an epistemological or maybe a hermeneutical problem at the beginning of Rousseau. If the problem of inequality is a natural condition to man, requires then that we understand who is man in his or her natural condition. And yet, when we look and see the people around us, all we see are human specimens so disfigured by the long experience in society that they don't resemble at all who people truly are. How do we then, as it were, go back and try and think through what man is at his or her essence, right? Man in that natural, in that natural sense. And this is important. Yes. But is it experience what makes you you? Rousseau says that by virtue of living in society, that everything about you becomes altered, right? Your way of thinking, your way of behaving, your way of acting, your way of speaking, and so on and so forth. Everything about you is changed by virtue of being in society. That there's an inner you that cannot be seen through all of the mess, the grind, the dirt. So a newborn is a, the real you. Not, not well. A newborn, yes, maybe at the very beginning, but since a newborn is brought up by her parents, learns to speak a language, which is the product of society and so on, that as soon as we acquire consciousness, we become altered by society, right? Society is the effect of alteration. And see, this is important for Rousseau because as he tells us in the preface, it is critical that we distinguish between what he calls natural and what is artificial in the present constitution of man. It is no such easy cat task to distinguish between what is natural and what is artificial in the present constitution of man and to make oneself well acquainted with a state which, if it ever did, does not now and in all probability never will exist. We might say never will again uh, exist. So this notion of who we are naturally, if we want to think about the question of inequality, which is the topic that Rousseau is inviting us to consider, we then have to find a way to get back to this condition which is impossible to return to, namely some natural condition. We then have to distinguish between the natural and the artificial. Again, very Hobbesian kind of dynamic, natural man versus all of the artifice of society, right? This kind of thing. To, put, to make it clear, for example, is the question of honor a natural feature of, human, of the human species, of human thinking? Is jealousy a natural human emotion? These are the kinds of questions that that Rousseau wants you to ask. He said, of course, everybody's jealous. Everyone cares about honor. But for Rousseau, it's not that clear. Roots, things like jealousy and honor, how do you know that they're not? How do you know those aren't things that are created by the civil society, the social environment around you? You may feel them. They may, may feel an absolutely fundamental, innate part of who you are. But how do you know that they are actually natural and not acquired over millennia? of social artifice. That's kind of the idea that he wants us, uh, wants us to think about in this, uh, in this thing. He says, it is the ignorance of the nature of man that casts so much uncertainty and obscurity on the genuine definition of natural right. How can we talk about natural law and natural right if natural man is him or herself hidden away from view? And the answer is, uh, we can. So therefore, this notion of the Lockean or the Hobbesian discussion premised on the principles of, of natural right, natural law, that those discussions are for Rousseau fundamentally compromised because the, the human being that comes into focus in a Hobbesian or a Lockean or a Grotian or a Pufendorfian or whatever framework is in fact not natural man. It is some civilized person who's then being thrown back into, into nature. Is that clear, the difference? 
I can't just take somebody who's lived in society and then imagine that they're now living outside of society. It doesn't work like that. There's a historical process. If I want to find the natural man, I have to go back before there was society, as it were, to some kind of primeval, natural, uh, natural under understanding, a natural, um, natural condition, natural environment. From this, according to my notes on 171, he says that there are, or he imagines, and this is what we'll pick up again in, in, in part one. Um, he says, laying aside all the scientific treatises, which teach us merely to consider men such as they have made themselves, and that would be someone like Locke or Ruth or Hobbes, right? Thinking about man as a function of the civil social forces around him. Um, and confining myself to the first and most simple operation of the soul, I think I can distinguish in it two principles, two principles of the, hum, of, of the natural human being prior to reason. Prior to reason. So another way of thinking about that is that there is a natural man who follows certain basic principles, two of them, that exist prior to reason. One of them is our, uh, our deep interest in self-preservation and welfare. And the other inspires us with a natural aversion to seeing any other being, but especially any being like ourselves, suffer or perish. So one is our inclination to preserve our own selves. And the other is our aversion to seeing people who look like us suffer. Now, let's go back to John Locke. What did John Locke tell us was the, what he called the law of nature. The law of nature was the preservation of the self and related what he calls the preservation of all mankind. That we have this obligation. Remember, liberty in the state of nature is not do what you wish, but do what you should. And that sense of what you should do comes about, remember from John Locke, I mentioned it last time, that the law of nature for John Locke is reason. It is reason that allows us to distinguish between doing what you should and doing what you want. That's what gives us this capacity to recognize the preservation of all mankind as being a law of nature. Whereas you recall that that's the distinction from Hobbes, right? Who argues that all that reason can do for us in a state of nature is for us to recognize as we're being aggressed upon that there's got to be some better way for us to live our lives. So look at what Rousseau suggests here. There are these two principles prior to reason. Before human beings had reason, we nonetheless had these principles that guided how we lived our lives as natural human beings. Preserve yourself, and it is a natural principle to, to be averse to seeing people who look like you, where she says all living things suffer. We don't like to witness suffering. So in this preface, as part of this agenda, if you will, for knowledge, we've established there's kind of a, core, a set of core fundamental ideas. One, that we have been so disfigured by the effects of society that we have to somehow find a way to eliminate those social effects, the civil social effects, if we want to think about who man truly was in a state of nature. The state of nature can never return once you have been tainted with uh, the effects of civilization, as we might call it. Second, that there was therefore a moment that lies at the heart of natural man, where the way we engaged around us was prior or before that we can imagine. Sorry. That's okay. A natural enthusiasm for Rousseau is highly understandable by throwing things around. You're not the first to start throwing things around when Rousseau starts speaking. I draw your attention to Edmund Burke, who hated the name of Rousseau so much that I think it made him grind his teeth in rage. Um, so that there's this notion of man in nature is man before reason, right? That, that this, this, um, this notion that we get from Locke, that we were placed into nature with our reason active. It's the reason that we have that allows us to distinguish the laws of nature. Rousseau rejects that. He's going to actually, we might call it historicized reason. Reason comes out or comes about as a function of this overall process that has allowed us to change over, over time. And so when we engage in this process, this, this sort of this mode of thinking, we are we can go back to what Rousseau calls it towards the end of the preface, the original man. 
right? The study of original man. So man in the, in the true state of nature, which we've seen already, we might add for Rousseau, man in a true state of nature equals the original, the original man. You can see then that there's an implicit critique developing inside of Rousseau against the Hobbesian or even the Lockean thought experiment. And we'll come to it in, in we'll come to it in a moment. But if you think about it, you can see that that by making the, the claims that he or by engaging in the analysis in this way, although the structure of, or let's call it the methodology that Rousseau is employing makes his text feel very familiar in the context of what we've already seen through a Hobbesian and Lockean lens. Yet the way he's doing it allows him to make a fundamental distinction from the Hobbesian or Lockean thought experiment of man in a state of nature. The, the Rousseauian original man is going to be very different from the Hobbesian or Lockean natural, natural man. You can assert, as, Locke, as Rousseau does, that this is because we exist inside of a state of nature prior to reason, fair enough. But you'll see there's another element of it well, which comes back to this notion of the ability for us to know who we truly are when we look, when we look at ourselves and now have to imagine going backwards in time, what did originally look like, right? What did, it, what did this actually originally look like? And actually, as a very quick aside, there was something in the night on this particular, this kind of topic, it's not related to Rousseau, but to give you an idea of what I mean, or what maybe to explicate a little bit what Rousseau means, there was something in the 19th century called, the, I think this is how you spell it. Are you doing keyboards for us here? Yes. Thank you. The polychromie strike. That's not very good German. Polychromie strike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because as you know in German, right, you can just take words and push them together and then so on. So, so. Um, you're unlikely ever to have heard of this, but uh, in, the 19th, in the 18th century, uh, German aesthetic thinking, I'm writing an article right now actually on German aesthetics in the, in the 18th century, so this is a bunch of my head. But there were German thinkers, people like, um, like Lessing or Wackenroder, right, who, 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 uh, who were thinking about this question of aesthetics and how things make us feel. And then this idea that, you know, when you see something that's beautiful, the, or see something that has aesthetic merit, the reason you know it has aesthetic merit is because it, it creates universal responses, right, a universal reaction. And so it moves us beyond language, beyond sensation and so on, into a world in, that is universally sublime. Um, not, for example, like the Rosalia song that I listened to this morning. I'm not sure that that could aspire to a universal aesthetic. But this would be like, for example, Michelangelo's statue of, of, of David, that kind of thing, right? Anyway, one of the um, features of this 18th century debate was that Greek statue, for, that, for many of these people, represented the height of a kind of universal aesthetic. You look upon a Greek statue, you can't help but be moved, right, with it beautiful, pure alabaster colors and the sensitivity with which it was sculpted and so on. And they were digging these things out of the ground. This is roughly contemporary with, for example, the beginning of the excavations in, in the Greek peninsula and Pompeii and so on. So more of these things were coming to light. And then in the 8th, 19th century, a, good, a German researcher discovered on some of these Greek statues evidence that there was color on the statue, right? That there was like little flecks of blue in the eyes or that uh, green on the clothing or something like this. And so there was this argument where there was a suggestion, academic discussion, that these Greek, this Greek statuary was actually painted. So you would do the statue and then you'd paint the eyes and the lips and give, you know, paint the hair brown and what so and so forth. And there were all these um, thinkers who simply could not accept that, that the Greeks would do this. Why would they take something so beautiful and paint it up with gaudy colors. It, it goes against the notion of the universal, uh, the universal aesthetic. And so there they were looking at these things in their kind of pure white marble form. And the idea that they could have at one point been colored, which is today we now know to be the truth, that in fact it was standard practice that you would paint, do the statue and then paint it. But it was shocking and jarring to, our, to the sensibilities. So there was a big argument back and forth and the argument got so heated that it eventually deserved its own name that was the polychromist type, which is you had two camps. I believe that the Greeks painted their statue 
and somebody on the other side, you're just an asshole, Bob. There's no way that they painted their statues in the back and forth the way. We've resolved that debate. But the interesting thing is that when somebody looked at a Greek statue and saw, you know, the pure essence of beauty and so on, they weren't seeing what was really there, right? They didn't have the, the tool set, as it were, to actually recreate the statue as it had been originally. And so if you'd ask someone, well, what was Greek statuary in the 18th century? And they were giving you all this bullshit about it. It was beautifully gleaming white marble and so on. That's not really what it was. And so therefore, if we want to get back to the beginning, we have to be able to engage in this kind of an inquiry. And so what for Rousseau, what Hobbes and Locke essentially have done is they've imagined man in a state of nature as this kind of gleaming white statue, as we imagine it to be based on what we see before us. But that can't be true because we also know that given the evolution of our history, that we've been changed by that very history. The knowledge that we have acquired over all that time has changed our ability to know ourselves. So we are, as it were, alienated from that true sense of who we are. We can't just sit down and think, look deeply into ourselves and get a sense of who we truly are in nature, right? That has, that has been missed. And that's the agenda then of the preface, to lay out an epistemological and a hermeneutical challenge. How do we know what we know? How do we set up, how, do we, how are we gonna be able to interpret then what we see around us and use it to then somehow get back into the past? Part one then picks up on this idea and then engages in that question, who are we uh, in, the context of that, in the context of that past, right? So part one is essentially very much in keeping with the Hobbesian Lockean idea of man in a state of nature. This is Rousseau's contribution to the question of who we are in a state of, uh, in a state of nature. And there's something quite interesting about, about this. He says at the beginning, or towards the beginning, that he says, let us begin by laying aside the facts, for they do not affect the question. The facts mean who are, who are we actually in a state of nature? Let's lay aside the facts, for they do not affect the question. The researches in which we may engage on this occasion are not to be taken for historical truths, but merely as hypothetical and conditional reasonings fitter to illustrate the nature of things than to show their true origin. So he seems to be saying, this is also like Hobbes, like Locke, a thought experiment, that we're gonna, not gonna worry about the facts. We're going to kind of create a hypothesis, fill it in so that we can get a sense of what the true nature of things may have been. But in fact, Having made this disclaimer, Rousseau then essentially contradicts himself because what he offers us in this first part of the discourse is really nothing less than a kind of anthropological analysis of man. He engages in practical questions like, where did language come from, for instance? And what did it do to us? How were we affected by it? He engages in what we would think of as proto-evolutionary theory in terms of speculating about how we've changed over time. And he seems to place us not outside of time and space, as would be the case if it were, if the facts didn't matter and it was purely hypothetical, but to the contrary, inside of a time and place, inside of a history that we have. And so it's an attempt to reconstruct, really, a history of who we were, even if we can never get back there, even if we can't be that person again, is it possible for us to go back and imagine who we would have been at the beginning of our own history. And this is a, you'll see this frequently referenced as a kind of, it was, a, 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 it was quite a, it was a popular mode of, of writing in the 18th century called histoire conjecturelle or conjectural or hypothetical history, or histoire conjecturelle. And the idea was linked to this sort of proto anthropological study um, is sort of how, how can we reconstruct some idea of who we used to be? Very famous um, essay, for example, um, by Diderot, who engaged in this kind of histoire conjecturelle thinking. You would look, for example, at the sexual practices of different peoples and then use it to sort of reconstruct how, what you used to be like. Right? That would be a, type, a, kind of, uh, a kind of thing. So Rousseau is engaging in the same thing here. It's an histoire conjecturelle. So even though he says, we'll lay aside the facts, it's purely speculative, et cetera, right? These researches are, are not to be taken for historical truths, yet that's exactly what Rousseau seems to think they are. These are historical truths, right? My little disclaimer, uh, my little disclaimer notwithstanding. 
Um, and the reason we have to do this, according to Rousseau, is that the people who have been talking about this prior to Rousseau have got it fundamentally wrong. And here's now the full, the full element of critique against someone like Hobbes. He writes shortly prior to laying out his own claims for an histoire conjecturelle, he writes, the philosophers who have examined the foundations of society have all perceived the necessity of tracing it back to a state of nature, as we saw Hobbes do, as we saw Locke do. I looked before, who were we before civil society? Fair enough, right? And Rousseau is going to do the same thing. All of them constantly harping on wants, greed, oppression, desires, and pride. What these philosophers have done is they've transferred to the state of nature ideas that only come out of civil society. In speaking of savages, in speaking of primitive man, they have described citizens. So that's the, I think that's a very powerful critique. Let's go back to what, what Hobbes said. Remember, Hobbes states that we're always in a war of all and again, of all against all, because we're always coveting other people's property, and therefore we can't truly really ever own anything, and we have the sense of diffidence, of distrust, and pride, and the rest of his life. But how do we know that we would feel any of those things if we had never been in a society to begin with? How do we know we would have developed that kind of mindset? This is what Rousseau is saying, in describing savages or in introducing us to the savage inside of the state of nature, all they've done is taken the citizen, someone who's lived in civil society, and put them inside of that, inside of that condition. You cannot presuppose civilization in a state of nature if what you're trying to do is argue how civilization comes out of a state of nature. It's a fundamentally flawed theoretical and methodological approach. And so for, um, for Rousseau, this is what we need to undo. We need to think about man before civilization. And that means thinking about before all the things that come with civilization. And as we've seen in the preface, what's something that comes with civilization? Reason. So all right away, we've invalidated, as it were, the fundamental basis upon which both Hobbes and Locke and Grotius as well construct their vision of what is a political society. He tells his reader, us, we are now all going to be good readers of Rousseau. And I remind you, if you have that iconoclastic streak in you, you should be reading this text and enjoying it. He says, oh man, oh, let's be a bit more inclusive. Oh woman or man, <laughs> or however you identify, it's a spectrum of whatever country you are. See, he's being inclusive. It doesn't matter your nationality. Whatever your opinions may be, attend to my words. Listen to what I have to say. This is Rousseau speaking to you. Here is your history. Look at yourself. You're a human being. I'm not going to tell you your history, where you came from. Here is your history, such as I think I have read it, not in books composed by your fellow men, for they are liars, but in the book of nature, which never lies. All of this work that's being done by the moral philosophers and political philosophers and so on, these are lies. Instead, we must somehow be able to inquire directly from within nature herself to discover who we are. Read my book in the spirit. Everything you've read up until this point is wrong. And now we will have an opportunity for us to inquire as to the nature of our true selves. Go back to this argument in the preface. We human beings who know these things, yet we know not ourselves. Therefore, why is it we know not ourselves? Because we've been fed lies. What we read is untrue. Therefore, the knowledge we acquire simply furthers our ignorance by peddling in, the, in, 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 in untruth. Therefore, we need to find a different way to get back to what really is the case. This is the beginning. I mean, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. He says, there is, I feel, an age. This is just at the end of the, of the just in the, the opening remarks of the first part of the discourse. He says, there is, I feel, an age at which every individual, see if this resonates with you. There is an age at which, uh, I feel, an age at which every individual would choose to stop time. And you will look for the age in which, had you your wish, your species had stopped. Discontented with your present condition for reasons which threaten your unhappy posterity with still greater worry. You will perhaps wish it were your power to go back in time. And this sentiment ought to be considered a panegyric of your first ancestors, a criticism 
of your contemporaries and a source of terror to those who may have the misfortune of coming after you. It's a bit like the fact that, right, you know the famous phrase that youth is wasted on the young? I don't know if you've, if you've heard that phrase, but anyway, youth is wasted on the young. You are all young, so your youth is currently being wasted on you because you don't know what to do with it. Well, that's the point about it. When is it that you appreciate your youth? When you no longer have it. When you can go back and you can consider, you know, the best time, the best age to be would be like 23, 25, whatever it might be. So it's an appreciation that can only come after the fact. You know the famous phrase, the owl of Minerva only flies at night. The knowledge we have of the system only comes after we've seen the system working. And so the knowledge we acquire is not something we can learn beforehand to help guide, but something we learn afterwards to help explain. This is the sort of notion that Rousseau is getting at. That we go back, we look at this, and we will see panegyric, it means a hymn of praise. We will go back and see that this early man, primitive man, original man, seems to have lived in a state of time, or in a state of being, sorry, that if we had the capacity to go back and stop time, we would. Because it seems to us to be, will seem to us to be so comparatively idyllic or better off than we are, than we are now. We can't do that. But the fact that we want to tells us one, understanding of what those conditions would have felt like in terms of where we are now. And also a sense of what he calls fear for what is to come, right? Notes those three things. He says, a panegyric, a hymn of praise for our ancestors, a criticism of the world around us, and a source of terror for those who have the misfortune to come after you. In a nutshell, that lays out, of course, the imperative of the social contract. We need to do better in terms of the civil societies that we construct around us so that the terror of those who have the misfortune of coming after us will not actually be felt so that we can do a little bit better and as it were somehow approximate a better condition but is that clear that he's really getting at? so thereafter in this first part he then engages in this lengthy discussion of what is that state of nature and i see i'm definitely going to run out of time so that's okay as i said i will continue this discussion in the afternoon group uh, and I'll cover the rest of part one um, and, 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 part, uh, and part two. Um, let me simply mention that he, he argues that there are these two features of, um, of who we are. Well, let me say mention three things that so will set up our, my discussion when I pick it up again this afternoon. This notion that we could live before reason, it seems to be a provocative one. After all, Aristotle told us that we are by virtue of our logos, by virtue of our reason, that's what makes us human beings. So it's a fundamental refutation of the Aristotelian argument, isn't it, that we could somehow live, as it were, pre-logos. The argument that he makes for that is that in this early state, this, or this, uh, this uh, um, environment of the original man, that we were lived in an equilibrium with our environment, that we were not seeking out things that essentially we lived off the land, that we had uh, we had what we needed. And in that context, we didn't need to think. Reason was an unnecessary expenditure of energy that produced no benefit. So it's not to say that we didn't reason in the sense that we couldn't distinguish things around it, but the use of reason, as it were, as a force of moving us forward, what we today might call innovation, was totally unnecessary. There's no need to innovate in a state of equilibrium. And I might mention, uh, there's a very famous essay that I taught in one of my classes this year, if you're interested, called The Original Affluent Society. Widely available on the web by a famous uh, um, American anthropologist named Marshall Salins, teaches at the University of Chicago, published 50 years ago, in which Salins argued that precisely, essentially that, that there are societies that we can observe even today who live in, in a state of almost perfect equilibrium with their environment to the point where they do not deploy human ingenuity to change the circumstances around them. They don't build new or better tools. They don't build new or better clothing. They don't invest in new and better technologies for housing. They simply live as their ancestors have done going back into the mists of time because they benefit from what Silence calls a kind of existential or uh, affluence, an affluence of their condition. To be affluent means either to have a lot or to want little. And in his and Salin's argument that the, he, he singles out, for example, the Kung tribe, that they, that they easily satisfy a set of limited wants. And there's nothing about where they are that propels them to thinking beyond that environment of wants. 
And in that kind of an environment, in that kind of a circumstance, you would not expect to see the manifestation of reason. And I don't mean that in a critical or value judgment way, but you wouldn't see people then employing human talents to change the environment around you because there's no need to change. This is essentially what Rousseau is saying 200 years prior to the Solon's paper, that early man, the original man, essentially can be understood to live in a kind of equilibrium. There are then two features which, as it were, disturbed or were destined to disturb that sense of uh, equilibrium or that sort of idea of living in an equilibrium, at least for Rousseau, asking the question, what was the spark? What was it that produced then this sort of first gesture of towards reason, allowing us to use our ingenuity to change the environment around us? And he said, unlike all the other creatures of nature, who are destined to live simply in nature without any capacity to affect or direct it. We human beings, by virtue of that, let's call it primitive reason, basic reason, we have what he calls free will or free agency. We have freedom. We have the capacity to decide what we want to do that allows us to move beyond the merely instinctual reactions of other animals. Don't live purely by our instinct alone. So this means that we have this potential, this capacity to act freely. And you also have, we also have embedded within us as a condition of this pre-rational originality, uh, what he calls, and it's a word that gives people a lot of problems in French, it's called perfectibilité, which you might think means perfectibility. but doesn't really mean perfectibility as much as it means for Rousseau, the, the capacity for make, for modifying, the capacity for changing, um, or maybe we might say for improving, but not improving in a teleological sense, but improving in a circumstantial sense. Um, and maybe the best way to capture the meaning of perfectibilité in English is to simply refer to it as perfectibilité. But anyway, usually we'll say the word improvement. That we have then this ability to act outside of the instincts of, of the, that nature's granted, and we have this capacity to change according to this principle of, of perfectibility. And this then means that we are destined, or human beings inside of this original state, were over the long course of time destined eventually to end up in a different state from the one in which they start, right? That we are, as it were, people of change. And that change was inevitable. It was simply going to happen by virtue of, uh, of our own identity. We are predetermined, we might say, to, be, uh, to have this change. Um, and so the combination then of free agency and perfectibility meant that we would inevitably evolve in the context of away from this original, from this original state. And once we've evolved away, it's impossible to go back. We can't de-evolve. In this way, so that's why uh, that's why we have to engage in this thought experiment, this histoire conjecturelle, to imagine what we would have been. But it's not some abstract person. This is for Rousseau who we really were. We really were people with free agency, people who lived in equilibrium, people who lived before reason, uh, who then, over time, over who knows how many generations, gradually changed the circumstances um, of the life around us. I'll tell you what, we've had a long discussion here. So why don't I stop there? Um, and as I say, I'll pick up again this afternoon with the afternoon group. I'll give them a very quick resume of the dedication and the preface. And I'll walk through with that group, books one and book two. And then I will post the entire, uh, the entire carnival uh, onto YouTube or, or wherever. Okay, so we don't need to log in to Zoom. You do not have to come for the afternoon class. I will post it online. And then if you decide to write about this topic, you can enjoy it. Uh, you can you can go through the entire thing at your at your leisure, okay? And that will give us, I think, I think it's better that way because then we can cover all of these concepts in the full detail that I think that they uh, that they deserve. Okay, so let's leave it there, and I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and I'll see you guys. I believe it is next week. Right? Back again next week. We'll be talking, I think we'll be talking next week. Well, I'll decide exactly how our schedule. Is going. I'll let you know. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thanks, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank bye. you, sir. Have a nice day. Bye.
Thank you, Kia. Oh, I can't know about blue boxes and stuff. Ugh. What will we have with all the right here? Tomorrow we're going to IKEA. Yeah. What are you gonna do with medicine? Yeah. And we need to like build it. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be fun. Yeah, there's no way that I'm gonna do that. <laughs> Thank God you're gonna have JB. Thank you.